their uh, doctor candidates, their family, their uh, ladies and gentlemen, friends and colleagues. I welcome you to this Fabrice College Disputas. And uh, on behalf, of, my name is Malik Zverevam. I'm a head of the Department of Civil and Transportation Engineering. And I'm re today representing, representing Dean of the Faculty of Engineering Science and Technology. It's a great day for, for NTNU and a great day for Fabrice, as well as for UNIS. And we're looking so forward to this discourse today, and I think you have done a good job, and all congratulations for coming so far. And I wish you good luck for the discourse. And I'm now going to introduce uh, Kåre Sønneset, that is going to be the administrator of the committee, and he will take you forward. Good luck. My name is Kåre Sønset, and it is my obligation as administrator to present the candidate, the evaluation committee, and the main supervisors to Mr. Karin's work. So please allow me to uh, repeat and add some to the presentations uh, given yesterday. Mr. Fabrice Karin was born in 1977 and is a citizen of both France and Norway. He obtained his master's degree in mathematics in the year 2000 at the famous École Nationale de France et Société in Paris. He came to uh, Longyearbyen in the year 2000, working at base camp, a nice place, and at the same time uh, being a graduate student at UNIS. From 2002 to 4, he was employed by Rogalans Forsting as a researcher concerning risk modeling of offshore drill operations. In the year 2004, he became a PhD student at the Department of Civil and Transport Engineering at NTNU. His interesting studies and work at Svalbard has been funded by Sture Norske Spitsbergen Company, by NTNU, Sintef and Unis meaning that his work is of interest to many people and organizations. The Faculty of Science and Technology appointed an evaluation committee with the following members. Professor Dr. Sven Knudsson is a professor in geotechnical engineering at Luleå University of Technology. He has his Master of Science degree from the University of Lund, 1972 and his PhD degree from the same university, 1983. He has uh, been a professor at Lulo University since, Technical University since uh, 1992. His uh, main field of research of interest is uh, frozen soil uh, and uh, permafrost and uh, uh, constructions uh, in, in uh, such soils. He uh, is the first opponent for giving the facts. Dr. Annelise Bergen uh, was appointed as the second opponent. She is a president of her own consulting company, Geofrost. She has had a Master of Science degree from the Norwegian University of Technology in 1977, and her PhD degree from the same university in 1983. Uh, her uh, main field of work is uh, artificially frozen ground, uh, improvement of, of the ground by freezing, 
and uh, of course she is uh, well uh, familiar with the permafrost and the uh, and, uh, constructions in frozen ground. My name is Corson Senneset, as mentioned, and I am a professor emeritus in geotechnical engineering at the Department of Civil and Transport Engineering at NTNU. So I was asked to be the administrator to the evaluation committee. The main supervisors for the doctoral work by Fabrice Karim has been the Professor Lars Lande and Professor Knut Heiland, both at the Department of Civil and Transport Engineering. Mr. Fabrice Karim successfully presented a trial lecture yesterday afternoon on the subject Coastal Erosion in the Arctic and the Changing Climate. The committee members approved the lecture and would like to express their opinion as follows. The candidate presented the subject in a very interesting, committed and well-structured way. There was perhaps a lack of balance between the general climate scenarios and the consequences for the erosion processes in the Arctic. The presentation was informative and pedagogically well-arranged with informative illustrations. The candidate answered questions both from the committee and the audience in a good way. The thesis is now to be presented by the candidate, after which there will be the discussion by the first and second opponents in the committee. Indication time schedule will be 30-35 minutes for your presentation. Then we take a 10 minutes break and uh, then we have the discussion about an hour. If anyone in the audience wants to participate in the discussion, it is possible to go to the tutorial after the discussions by the opponents. So now I have the pleasure to give the word to you, Paris. relaxed after all these formalities, but uh, I will start my presentation on, uh, on my thesis with the title Coastal Sea Ice Action on the Breakwater in a Microtidal Inlet in Svalbard. And the picture here is from Svea, uh, more precisely Badinesse. And that would, of course, create uh, challenges. If we look at the map, we see Svea <coughs> in the middle up there, and Barinese, which was uh, what we saw in the picture earlier. And you would have to cross over to Litrovnese or to Klenemoren in some way. About, um, among the challenges, uh, you have to deal with uh, the stability of the, sea, of the seabed, with the uh, ice loads, and with the transit of water. This is um, a river delta, Bragansovogen, <coughs> and you have uh, quite some water going through, plus the tidal water uh, twice, twice every day. When we looked at uh, <coughs> This is uh, the old, uh, the old uh, coal key in Svea. When we looked at, at it, uh, especially in winter time, we assumed that ice forces would be one major problem, and, and that was what I decided to concentrate my work on. 
So the goal of the thesis was to look at, um, at the actions of sea ice on coastal structures in general. In order to study that, I, I constructed or I, I supervised the construction of, um, of a test breakwater. And, um, and I, will, uh, I will start my talk with uh, showing some pictures from this construction, this construction process. And then I will spend most of my talk on observations that I did during a, a full season, observations of the, uh, the sea ice. Uh, next to this breakwater. Uh, I will, um, in the next step, show some, some quantitative results, and finally I will talk about possibilities for further work. So before we could uh, build the breakwater, we, we had to investigate the, um, the ground properties. Here we are drilling outside of Badinesse, and we're checking water content in the soil. We drilled down to 11 meters. And uh, salinity and grain size, that would give us an idea of the stability and how, how we needed to build. We also took uh, a test of the, um, of the seabed. This is a, called a vein, te vein test, where we test the, the shear strength of the seabed. And the person in the picture is actually Philip. The mass, uh, Louis' father, and he's sitting here in the room. And we and we checked or we measured the water depth is uh, with great help from uh, NGU, Louis Louis Hans in NGU, using a so-called shallow water swap bathymetry system. And here we see the. Uh, the profile of where there is a ridge in the middle, a quite shallow ridge, and at low water you will, you can actually walk there. The construction itself uh, was done pretty much this way. Uh, we constructed in two stages in order to stabilize the ground. So first uh, to middle water level, middle water or high water level, and then we constructed uh, a couple. Of or three meters above. Um, when we construct structures, uh, coastal structures, uh, they are subjected to erosion from the sea. And uh, here is a sketch showing just four, four days, uh, the, the, the profile, the original profile of the, of the breakwater and just four days after how it looked like. So we, when we, so we have to, to protect it against, to protect such structures against erosion. And uh, the way we did it was to use uh, geothen, geosynthetic bags, so-called geo bags, which is the trade name actually. And here we see we put them on a layer, which is a, a filter layer to avoid that material is washed away, um, which is also a geo, geosynthetics. So the, the, these, these bags are actually the subject of a, another study that I was involved in and that led to uh, the, the work with the Sintef that Corda mentioned and uh, got us um, uh, funding from the NFR. Uh, there is a report, a uh, specific uh, project uh, report on the bags. I am not going to go very much into it. Here is a picture of the, of, the, of the structure when it was finished. In the, in the background, we see the coal coming out of Sveanur, which is the, the mine in the activity right now in Sveanur. Here is a picture from the breakwater. From, uh, it was 50 meter long, uh, 8 meter high at the highest, and uh, 25 meter wide. Uh, we, I, I, I installed a number of instruments on the breakwater. Here uh, is the sketch from the um, <coughs> temperature uh, gauges I had. And there was one vertical cable that doesn't appear here. And then a cable along, uh, along, along the front of the breakwater. And the, the small cables perpendicular are actually into, inside the, some of the bags. 
These uh, thermistors were connected to data loggers inside a small cabin that I, I had uh, at the front of the breakwater. I had power, power in there, I had a PC, I had even internet. And, uh, and there is a weather station, uh, headlights, because uh, of course, uh, quite, or during the winter time, uh, most of the work was during darkness. There are a couple of surveillance cameras to follow the ice when I was not on site. And uh, in addition to that, there, uh, there I installed a tidal wave gauge out uh, got for, uh, 50 meters or 100 meters out from, uh, from the breakwater. Uh, on top of one of the mountains, surrounding mountains of uh, Svea, I had a time-lapse camera that was directed against the Sveasunne and took pictures <coughs> up to twice, <coughs> twice per hour. So now I will talk a little bit about um, the, the observations of the ice th that I made. I started to make observations uh, at the beginning of the of the sea of the, the ice season uh, in October, and uh, and up until uh, breakup, which was end of June, I went to Svea almost every week and and um, was there for two three days every week. And I uh, took pictures and documented and, and measured whatever I could measure. And um, this work was actually the most demanding. Uh, when, you, when, you, when you write uh, scientific articles, it feels very safe to have uh, quanti quantitative data and, and to, plot, uh, to plot data and, uh, and, um, and to discuss it. But uh, it's uh, it's much more challenging actually to to uh, go on site and to not know what to observe uh, and to um, to have to to write down meticulously everything you observe and and uh, and uh, week after week you start to get a grasp of what is actually happening and you get an idea of what could you measure here. So you're actually doing what I feel is really real research. It's not just installing instruments and hoping that the data you measure will give something interesting. So I will show you some of the pictures and, and basically the, the, um, the, the ice season is divided in three. You have the freeze up first, then you have what I call the stationary ice cover period when the ice is, the whole fjord is, uh, is, uh, is covered with ice. Uh, and then um, at the end of the spring, when the the break up, when the, uh, the ice breaks up, obviously. The freeze up uh, starts with the uh, cold temperatures, and uh, there is still there is no ice yet on the on the on the sea, but the ice freezes on the shore and creates uh, a cap that is um, what we call the ice foot, um, and. And it can take different forms. Here was uh, the previous picture was in the front of the breakwater, and uh, this picture here is on the side looking towards Svea. And here it's a little bit it's a different form. The the ice foot is is formed of uh, of uh, ice cakes stacked upon each other. That has to do with the current current and uh, and winds and or wind wind uh, wind direction. During the stationary ice cover period. Like I said, basically everything is covered in ice and you have even snow on top of that, so you don't see really much. What we can see here are some cracks in the ice, and that is something that I've described. Um, these cracks are due to the tide, and the, even if it's covered in, in, in ice, the sea is, is still moving up and or the, the, yeah, the, the sea is still following the, the tide. So the ice is moving up and down twice a day, and it's cracking up uh, due, due to this movement. And the zone which uh, the cracks cover, cover is uh, what I call the hinge zone. It's, uh, it's a hinge mechanism you, you have there. At each crack, each crack works like a hinge. 
And during the ice uh, ice cover period, the, the the boundary between the ice foot and the sea ice is is not clear. You cannot you cannot easily see here or decide here where the ice foot stops or where the sea ice stops. So I've uh, numbered the cracks. There were five uh, tight cracks actually, and going parallel to the to the breakwater, with in addition some radial radial cracks. So the good thing with the or the advantage of doing a presentation compared to uh, writing a thesis, is I can show you some videos. And uh, the first video is of a oh sorry, the first video is of a crack opening. And this is a, so it's a time lapse video every hour or every half hour during the tide. So you see the crack opening here. That is due to the tide movement. And there is, a, again with the tide, the crack is opening and the, the sea level is actually higher than the ice level. So the, the sea is flooding the ice and then conse consequently it's freezing on top and it's building up the ice from, from above. In addition to, of course, the ice growing from below due to, due to freezing also. And this is... Uh, Again, some of the same uh, mechanism of fl the flooding. And you see the camera is actually out on the sea ice, so the camera is going up with the, with the tide. That was it for the stationary ice cover period. And, uh, sorry. and then we go to the breakup. The breakup starts with uh, the river Chedstrom Alba coming from the valley. In, in, to the left, and you see the river flowing on top of the ice, actually. And during the breakup, we see here the whole season, the whole uh, breakup period, with the time lapse camera from top, from the top of the mountain, and the movement. The ice is going back and and forth uh, with the the, ti the with the tidal current. So that, ex that explains why the ice is going back and forth. And every time, or uh, gradually, you have more and more ice coming or detaching from, from the left, from Vagansavogen. And if you, if you observe uh, Balinese, you see that quite, quite some uh, ice was drifting there and getting stuck. That, uh, that was taken uh, with pictures every hour. And during the breakup, we see the ice foot coming back. The, the sea ice detaches from, uh, from land, and now we see an ice foot again. By the way, it's uh, an ice foot, it's not a nice foot. <laughs> uh, and there, um, the, the ice foot is, is beginning to decay. The chunks of ice are falling in the sea. During the breakup, we also observe uh, pileups, ice pileups. Here is a, I have a sequence of three pictures taken with five seconds um, uh, distance. I go through them. If you look at on the on the corner there, the ice is actually pushing the boat in on there. I can go back. So um, uh, that is, um, of course, due to the ice is coming from Bergansavogen, and all, all this ice has to come, has to pass this narrow uh, inlet of Sveosjöne, and is pressed on the sides, and pressed up on land. A picture from, uh, I think that was from 2005, where, uh, where the pileup was uh, more consequence. And there can also be ride up 
the ice is instead, instead of uh, being piled up on land, its uh, ice uh, flows are simply pushed up on the shore. It should be noted that these, cons compared to what you can observe other places in Arctic, this is nothing. Uh, these are very small pileups and rideups. I have a video on, from a, a ride up. You see how it how it works. The you have the the flow has quite some inertia, and it's pushed up on land, and it breaks, and uh, a small uh, chunk is left on on the slope. So that was it for the the observations. I did some um, some measurements with the dif differential GPS of um, of the profile of the of the to topography of the ice outside the breakwater. And here you see the the rover, rover one, rover two. These are the uh, differential GPS instruments that measure the position. So I, I had them in a fixed position, and I was measuring through the tide, so I could plot the the topography. Uh, this, uh, this sketch shows um, other features. You see the cracks, crack one, two, three, four. Uh, so the, the light blue is, of course, the sea ice. The dark blue is uh, the water. So here you see on, on high water, it is flooded. The, the ice is flooded. And you see the profile of the breakwater. Uh, you see stress sensors uh, to the left. These are sensors we placed um, it was uh, together with Sebastian Barreau. We had an experiment where we measured the stresses. We figured that, uh, or we assumed that the stresses uh, would, uh, on each on each side of a crack, would vary with the tide. And indeed, we observed variation. Uh, however, the values that we measured, uh, uh, or the, the the way we measured, doesn't allow us to use the the, the values. Um, in an engineering um, uh, context. So it, it's an experiment that needs more, uh, more thorough uh, or more work. Uh, yeah. Here is the profile on uh, low tide, and the ice is not flooded anymore. Uh, we also had also with uh, Sebastian Marot and uh, Magnus Fabrias and a uh, master student, Sebastian Marot is a PhD candidate here at UNIS, uh, with uh, and Magnus Fabrias, who, who was a uh, 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 master, master uh, student. We took cores of the, of the ice, of the coastal ice. Um, I thought I had a map of this. We took back, we took cores of the of the ice. Mostly, we took 33 cores, mostly horizontal cores, and uh, at uh, five different locations, four locations outside of the breakwater, at distances uh, up to 20 meters from the breakwater, and there was one site out on the sea ice, on the free-floating ice, uh, that we used as a comparison. And we, the, the goal of the study was to to see how the properties of the sea ice would vary, uh, especially. The, uh, we tested these cores in uh, in the lab here at Unis uh, on a on a device called Knekis, uh, which was built uh, at NTNU, uh, and basically which compresses the ice, and we can we can measure we we can measure the stresses and. Uh, and, uh, and um, the displacements. So what these, uh, this study showed was that the ice has a higher porosity closer to the shore. It has a lower density closer, closer to the shore, so it's a very, very porous and low density, low density ice. Also low salinity and a low Young's modulus. It had uh, one <coughs> gigapascal uh, the, the Young's modulus was 1 gigapascal compared to 1.5 for the for the sea ice, for the, the free floating ice, and it also had a, it crept less than um, than the, 
than the free floating ice. The, as I said, uh, I will just finish giving some clues of uh, what kind of, in which direction uh, this work could be continued. One, um, one specific uh, issue is uh, the prediction of the breakup date. That was uh, actually a topic uh, that we were discussing a little bit with, uh, with the people in Svea. They have their own opinion on uh, when or at what time uh, what moon phase uh, would uh, trigger the the the, the breakup and uh, these kinds of and and uh, kinds of um, of considerations and uh, I haven't found a good pattern for that. Uh, it obviously has to do with the uh, with the um, thawing of the river, the start of the river flow. Uh, I measured the temperature in the water, so you can by measuring the temperature in the water you can see. You, you can start to predict when it's going to happen. Another uh, topic is uh, the, the investigations of the seabed conditions, because uh, that's also a topic, that's a topic we discussed internally. Uh, I was working with a geologist on, uh, quite a lot in Svea, and uh, we never, we could never, we were never sure whether there is uh, subsea permafrost in uh, in uh, Sveasun uh, or not, and we made we we made some mo a model and uh, and found that it, there probably is, but uh, we haven't proved proved it and and uh, it would require some in on-site investigations. Also, this uh, these uh, stress uh, measurements that we did. Uh, it was only a, only a start, and we could we only measured the stress in the top of the of the, the ice, 20 centimeters below the below the top. But the ice is actually up to 1.5 meters thick. So we are, what are we actually measuring? Uh, that's that's a question. And, and so so this um, this uh, this uh, study um, obviously requires further investigation. Then uh, there is the numerical work. On uh, modeling, modeling these uh, stresses. Uh, that's something I was working on in uh, in Helsinki. I had a, uh, I had a stay in Helsinki working with the Yuka Tukuri, and uh, and did some modeling, some numerical modeling. Unfortunately, I ran out of time and and did not have the time to to write anything about it. But basically, you have to model that the the ice is floating, which in itself is a challenge. Uh, believe it or not, uh, and um, and then you have to model the friction. The, the the goal was to find where where the cracks, where the tight cracks would occur. So you have to 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 find um, uh, to, model, to 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 have the the right properties of the ice. That was one of the reasons why we measured them. And then when one crack has occurred, you need to know to model how how it is going to work. In this track, what 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 is the what are the processes? Processes? How is the friction there? Um, and if uh, succeeding with uh, such uh, such such modeling work, you could you could continue on the design values uh, on the more on the engineering on the engineering part to to, to give design values for uh, structures coastal structures. That was it. Thank you for <coughs> your attention. Yeah, thank you for a very interesting and illustrative overview of uh, your work. You certainly have been cold several times, I believe. <laughs> been cold, yeah. <laughs> now we take a break of 10 minutes. And then you will have the discussion with the opponents. You should be back here, uh, yeah, 10 to half. 10 minutes past 10.